Hello, everyone. <laughs> Welcome to Vermont Studio Center. Uh, I am Kristen Mills. I'm the Visual Arts Program Manager, and I am so excited that you're here. I'm especially excited that Lisa and Janelle Iglesias are with us tonight. <laughs> Las Hermanas Iglesias is a project-based transdisciplinary, uh, as a collective, they are transdisciplinary uh, they, have, they make transdisciplinary work that explores issues of hybridity, social participation, and transnational identities. Their collective has fluidly evolved to include a number of team efforts and variations, including steady collaborations with their mother, Bo, and uh, they, as mothers, as creators, and as educators, create artworks that disrupt borders, engage absurdity, and promote the benefits of working together. This is one of the main reasons why I asked them to talk because of all of what I just read, um, but mainly about being artists and makers in the world today and how they do it together and how they do it separately. I understand that they are two separate individuals with, they digest their own food separately. You know, they do everything separately, including making art. They also do a lot of that together. Well, except for the food part. Um, Lisa, let's see. Lisa is currently uh, in South Hadley, but is has just joined the Department of Art at Mount Holyoke College as an associate professor. And she has done residencies at Provincetown Fine Arts Work and Bema Center for Contemporary Arts. And she was at Vermont Studio Center in 2007 and in 2009. She's also a Pisces. Happy birthday, Lisa. We can sing to her at any time. Please, I'll go out and break into song if you want. Um, <laughs> Janelle is an assistant professor at the University of California, San Diego. She is zooming in from the West Coast, three hours uh, behind or before or whatever. Uh, let's see. Lisa is an alum from Skowhegan and uh, has been supported by the Joan Mitchell Foundation, the Pollock Krasner Foundation, and the Jerome Foundation. She has done research on barrow birds in the rainforest of West pa 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 Papua. How do you pronounce that? Sorry. Papua? Papua. Okay. It's great. And Janelle was here at VSC in 2010 for two consecutive months. Um, I know both Lisa and Janelle from something and a whole nother life. And I'm so excited to have them virtually together. Uh, I don't think I have anything else to say. Oh, Lisa is, I mean, Janelle is a Gemini. I meant to say that too. So uh, apologies for that. And uh, yeah, the floor is yours. I'm going to, I'm going to make sure that you both are spotlighted and go ahead, do what you got to do. Thank you so much, Kristen. Mm. Oh my God, this, this is already so gorgeous. I love seeing all of your faces and your names and um, this is the best. <laughs> Thank you all for coming. It's really uh, super lovely to have so many, um, so many people we adore in the same virtual space. Um, and thanks for the invitation, Kristen and, and Vermont Studio Center, um, for the invitation to share share our work and speak um, with everybody tonight. Yeah, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. I'm probably going to do this in a clumsy way. Um, you know. Okay. I did. Tonight I'm also going to um, add in some links in the chat as we talk about some different things. Um, so I started with our website, which is very dated. It's up to date, but it's in the midst of being revamped. Um, so uh, that's in the chat. That's like um, a long project. Yes. Many of you can relate, I think, probably. Right. Um, and also, we're so happy that um, the, the our talk was started with the, the land acknowledgement by Kristen. So thank you for that. Um, and Janelle, if you'd like to start off. Yeah, I'm zooming in from San Diego, California, which is the unceded territory of the Kumeyaay Nation. And I'm joining you from South Hadley, Massachusetts, located on the traditional homelands of the Nipmuc and the Kumtuk. And Janelle and I often start by situating ourselves like in relationship to each other. Um, starting out talking about our practice together, our relationship together, it's very much about how we relate together. Um, we've been collaborating uh, maybe since 2005 in terms of art with a capital A, whatever that is supposed to mean, but we've been you know, collaborators for life. Um, and, and this is one of the, in terms of mark making, this is one of the earlier examples of that from 1982, um, a drawing that I was super proud of that I did, but then Janelle added her own marks and I, was, were, was, I, I wasn't I was so happy. 
Um, but it, at that time, but now, of course, I am. And this is a, a favorite relic of our earliest collaborations. So we've been working together in this way since we were little. And as Kristen pointed out, so oftentimes we are pointed to as twins, though we are not. However, we were always like dressed, we were indeed treated as twins in many ways. We were dressed similarly. We both received um, limitations as well as like, um, uh, uh, you know, things that we, you would graduate to as you get older at the same time. So we were often treated as a duo from an early age. So we've named ourselves uh, when we when we decided to sort of give a name to our collaborative practice after graduating with our MFAs. Um, we both moved back to New York City and the attempt to have a studio together and to see what would happen if we started collaborating. Uh, we decided on the name Las Hermanas because it really spoke to our identities as centering this, this identity of sisterhood um, and collaborative practice and also a kind of feminist undertone as well. Um, in the previous picture of Lisa and I in those little dresses, we're wearing these little traditional Norwegian outfits. Um, our mom was born in Foldal, Norway, which is a tiny mountain village. And our father, Bienvenido, was born in Santo Domingo, Dominican Republic. Um, they both immigrated to the States um, and met in an Irish pub in Queens, uh, where we were born and raised. And the, the, those sort of movements um, are at everything to where Janelle and I are, they're, they're touchstones for, for, for all of our work together um, in terms of our studio practice and in terms of how we situate and anchor our identities. We're gonna give you a little bit of window into what we do as, separate, as separately, as separate artists. Um, my work is grounded in patterns um, and geological processes that I reference across materials. So sometimes I'll be working with collage or with textiles or with sculpture, um, but it's very much grounded in these ideas of repetition and pattern across materials. Um, one of the works that I'm uh, working on right now um, are these is a collection of portraits of people who have uh, put work towards social justice in the United States that I started in about 2008. So the project is ongoing and accruing and accumulating um, as we speak. And sometimes the drawings and paintings that I do turn into stop animations. So if for, for, for the curious, you can always go onto Vimeo and see an example of the stop animation that's online. And I just put the link uh, in the chat for that video as well. I'm gonna show a couple of slides of, of my individual practice. My work is rooted um, in working with and through objects. Um, you know, it incorporates both, uh, both the found, the manufactured, the organic, the inorganic. And I'm really interested in what happens when these things are put into new conversations with each other. Um, so there's this kind of choreography of objects and materials that are often uh, found in the places that, upon which they're going to be installed. And so they have a relationship to that place um, and they kind of form their own, um, their own logics, which is a kind of illogic um, way that they would, you might encounter them in quote unquote, the real world outside of the gallery. And in doing this, I'm really interested in how it reveals kind of new truths and um, the kind of hidden powers of consumption and capitalism um, and reveals different relationships uh, that are often quite problematic that we have with the environment. Uh, we're going to show a project right now that um, really embodies that kind of movement, that movements that our parents took in moving to Queens, New York, and our experience of being raised in the United States. Um, and also, as we go forward and talk about this collaborative work, we'll also talk about ways that Janelle's individual practice and my independent, independent practice get together and like you know, make babies and turns into different things. With this project, Everybody Likes to Dance, uh, we asked our parents to pick songs that really represented their youth to them. And so our mother chose a Norwegian pulse, which is very similar to a polka. And our father chose a merengue from the Dominican Republic. And then we invited five uh, musicians to mash them together to create new songs and new movements, new sounds. Um, and so then this song was then uh, accompanied by a choreography where we blended the dance of the pulse and the dance of the merengue, which turned into a dance diagram and kind of this multi-layered 
project that we'll show you right now. If I'm, I'm gonna click so that you can hear some of uh, one example, one of the songs. The songs ranged from uh, danceable, very danceable uh, set music that, that you could really kind of, uh, that was very melodic to songs that had a lot of dissonance and a lot of uh, kind of static and clash. So we were interested in that kind of range for, of harmony and, and, dis and dissonance. So you can hear with that, with the songs, you can hear the fiddles, you can hear um, the singing and all of the various points of contact that where the, the songs are merged together. And here you can see an example of the diagram that became a painted dance floor for participants to engage with. And oftentimes our projects are um, somewhat of an excuse for us to, in, to us to kind of delve into and learn about things that we're really excited about. So for this project, we actually got to learn the pulse. Um, we were at a residency in Paris that had different um, artists from all over the world. And it happened that the artists from Norway that were there were from the same region as our mom. So we weren't uh, close to our mom, but we were trying to figure out how to learn this dance without our mom being there. And then we actually got these dance lessons in person from these two wonderful um, Norwegian artists um, while we were there. And then uh, the mashup that you see, uh, the dance diagram floor is a hand painted painting, um, but yet at the same time, it's also a dance floor. Um, it's also this usable participatory event all of a sudden. And Janelle and I often, talk, when we talk about this project, we often talk about how like it was wonderful that people were following steps, but often our favorite part of that project was people would create their own rules and their own way of interacting with that dance floor. So that sometimes a game would be created or a, a totally altogether different uh, dance would be created. Uh, and the dance uh, floor, you know, uh, put uh, the dance diagram was a direct reference to the Andy Warhol paintings installed on the floor. Um, oh, and just another shout out is that we these were turned into takeaway posters so that people could take uh, the dance diagram home with them. Uh, this is also speaking of France, where we had a residency together where we learned the pulse. This is a project that we developed there um, called Lost Glove. And in this project, Janelle and I would collect, look for gloves when we would go on our walk, which was like our main source of entertainment was going on these long walks, either individually or together. We would come home so excited when we'd find a new glove and we would recreate its lost twin um, out of with a gouache on paper painting. And it was, a, it was one of those like very early ways that Janelle and I were really blending our interests in, and, and foundational kind of background in painting and drawing and sculpture. So we definitely we very much think of this as like blurring boundaries between ca you know, categories. And one of the one of the highlights of that project was for me was getting painting lessons from Lisa on how to kind of create these faux finishes of, of different like fur or knit or um, how to how to shade how to correctly color mix. Um, and so I think for us, our collaboration has always been a way in that has had complete freedom in that um, we can we've decided early on that that the idea of collaborating could be completely open. Whereas one person could do one part, the other could do the other. We could both do everything. Um, we could bring other people in, such as the musicians and everybody likes to dance. Uh, we could learn something completely new. We could be the experts, uh, quote unquote, with, with, a, with a part of it. Um, but we could also bring in other, other kinds of experts um, as well and other family members as we'll, we'll kind of go on to talk about. 
Um, this next project is also a, an early formative project in which we were kind of continuing to explore our family dynamics. And in this case, um, as siblings. And so we made pinatas of ourselves. Um, and then we proceeded to, uh, to beat each other up. Um, so here's our, our self-portrait pinatas. And here I am um, beating up Lisa. And um, these were filled with these red candies. Um, and red sparkles. And so then they burst open. It was also kind of a, a formal aesthetic gesture. The audience was invited to, to take the candies from the pinatas, um, which is also another, um, of course, gesture to Felix Gonzalez Torres and um, a much more serious piece in which um, folks will take the, the candies, you know, from the corner of the gallery space. Um, and I think Lisa just uh, flipped. If you go back, we've also, um, um, like I was just saying, we've also um, you know, shown this project where pinata makers will make a pinata of each of us. And we've had the curators or the public um, bash in the pinatas as a kind of performance of the piece as well. Um, so we're, we're always really interested in kind of seeing what happens um, when we work with different people and, and work in different contexts. We're really open to changing how the how pieces get shown, how they might get totally revamped um, and revisiting them in different ways. Along with Felix Gonzalez Torres with, you know, the candy projects, of course, takeaway posters is, is super dear to our practice. Um, and uh, his work has really influenced us in a wide variety of ways and on the, in the takeaway poster realm. For many of our projects, we try to accompany the, a project or an installation or an exhibition with a takeaway so that viewers can um, interact with a, a, a sculpture that will dwindle in size and, and, and gradually disappear, but also take something for free. Um, in many of these cases, we work with um, uh, wordplay and also create sort of like a double-sidedness so that they, they can be, like as Janelle was mentioning before, installed in different ways, shown in different ways, um, and interpreted in different ways. We're gonna jump kind of like to a different look, bit of a project right now. And this is in terms of our collaborations, this is one of the earliest collaborations that we did with our mother, Bo, Bode Hill. And um, in terms of these nude suits, the nude suits project in which uh, Bo knit us uh, suits in measurement with our bodies. Um, and we were very much re referencing art historical paintings in which the body um, especially the of the female form is you know arranged in landscape and so this is uh, multiple kind of tongue in cheek references to historical paintings um, and interacting with each other in different landscapes so for example we've worn these suits in in the dunes in Provincetown or in lichen fields in Norway um, so in different places this has taken place and for that project continues to, to grow and morph as well. This is uh, Lisa with her son Bowie, who's one year old in this in this photo. And our mother had um, knit him a birthday suit for his first birthday. So he's joined us in a little baby nude suit. Um, and uh, I have a feeling we have some new baby nude suits coming as well um, for, for future photographs. So are we, are we volunteering her to do that? Or did she say she was going to do that? Ask her to do that. Um, so yeah, I, I think one of the one of the things that at least that often happens with projects is that uh, you know we we do a project and then uh, we'll often revisit it and it'll it'll come into a new a new kind of chapter or series with that project later on depending on what's happening in our lives. Yeah, that sort of indeterminacy of the life of a project is will come up more and more. And here is Bodhild right now. You can see her here being referee for one of our performances. Um, in which we uh, reference uh, beauty contests and Olympic trials. Because we're, you know, we're children of the 80s and 90s. So we're facing off each other. And this is part of our competition series, um, which uh, has, which also, I think, I believe started in a, during the residency in Paris, Janelle, when Janelle and I were trying to figure out different ways of making decisions and collaborating. And we, uh, one of the ways that we did this was play ping pong against each other and create these situations where we would be co in competition with each other, direct, directly referencing sibling rivalry and these other ways of, um, of having serious contests. We take, we take this very seriously. 
<laughs> and we also remember that when we were little, we would have contests about everything, um, like children often do. But sometimes our, our contests were also about um, beating our own kind of high score with something and working together as well. Um, so we, we reenact some of these childhood contests. Um, so here we are jumping rope in a gallery. Um, we, do, we often do some really absurd and ridiculous things that um, make us look pretty gross. There's a cherry eating contest um, in which uh, there's a bubble gum, uh, you know, bubble uh, who can, who can uh, make the largest bubble. Um, and this series kind of led into another series um, that we wanted to talk about tonight, which is called Commiserates. Um, so these were taken during Lisa's um, pregnancy with her, her son Bowie in 2012. Um, they're really uh, kind of, um, you know, on the fly photographs that we took, uh, you know, with a phone. Um, I believe earlier that day I had attempted to carry around a watermelon as a, as, as a kind of gesture of solidarity um, rather than a project, but just as something we would do that afternoon. And I quickly gave up. Um, and then we decided to take a photograph with the watermelon um, and then thought we might, might also see if we could take other photographs where I kind of competed um, with Lisa's amazing belly. And it was one of those projects where, again, we weren't sure what was going to happen with it, but it was a gesture that we that had an open ended life cycle to it. So uh, this is a photograph taken uh, about two years ago. And um, and this was so this would be called Commissarates 2. The, the previous photographs were called Commissarates 1 and very much like this. This series has really changed its identity and form and it's kind of letting us know what it wants to be along the way. Um, yeah. And at this pregnancy, um, for me, I, I had a stillbirth. And so instead of stopping this, the series, um, when Janelle came to be with me, when that pregnancy, um, ended, um, we turned it into a project, uh, or we, we continued the project. Um, and, uh, and so it, this project has that kind of open-ended, um, kind of reacting to our life, as Janelle mentioned, on the fly kind of approach, where now the project is also bringing in information about pregnancy loss and about um, collecting resources about uh, pregnancy and and and, um, and loss and and so th now the it's continuing to change and grow. Um, and then this is the most recent commissariat's four taken in December with uh, Janelle uh, Janelle on. Sep uh, in San Diego, California, and myself in Massachusetts, and um, and not being able to be next to each other because of the pandemic. So ordinarily, we would be doing this project together. So it reflects also the time period and is and adapts to those kind of changes as well. Um, and then, of course, we'll we plan to take this photo again sometime next month when my body will keep on changing as I'm pregnant at the moment. And, um, and Janelle will have an object or have her, or have um, your, your baby at, like, we'll, we're going to be taking the photograph again. We don't really know how we're gonna do that. <laughs> so it, it has like this open-ended quality and we're not sure how, where it will go or if the project will end or if it will continue reflecting um, our connection to each other, our bodies, our empathetic relationship, we'll see. And one of the things we've, we've always been um, really adamant about since we began this collaboration is that um, it could be personal and it could be vulnerable and it could be familial and that um, we saw those things as um, as academic and as powerful and as forms of research to share. Um, and we wanted to make sure that, um, you know, to kind of focus on the, the value of those things, um, especially um, raising children and, and being children ourselves, being daughters, being in relation, being in community, rather than being um, complete individuals, which I think our, our culture in general and specifically the art world tends to really focus on. Um, so the um, one thing I wanted to notice that we put in the chat, a recent essay about this project by Chris Scorza, who's an amazing um, uh, curator and of, of a 
um, Education and Programming at a Museum of Contemporary Art San Diego. And she wrote an essay for a, a local journal here in San Diego called Herein. I just want to give them a shout out. And that's in the chat. And also this open source resource list um, that we compiled for a panel discussion we did with the um, New Mexico State University's um, Museum of Art. We were in a show about motherhood and we were on a panel where we um, created this open source resource list around pregnancy loss and grieving um, for that. And it's something that people can add um, resources to and also offers different artists that have dealt with the subject matter as well. So please add to it. That would be great. And that's that's this list. I can't see what's next. So I'm always like prognostic. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Virgo, so in terms of like that idea of open source, like I, th I think it's attached to this idea of interactivity that Janelle and I are really interested in being surprised by the artwork. And sometimes that surprise comes from an experimental process or something that we don't know everything about yet. Um, but it also has to do with uh, having these participatory moments. And so that happens sometimes within paintings where they're able to be um, opened. And then there's other kind of avenues for suggesting and directly inviting um, interactivity. The artworks that Janelle and I do, as we mentioned before, also hark to our, hearken to our backgrounds in sculpture and painting and drawing and blurring those boundaries and also mining the sort of um, the stuff that we grew up around, which we can very much point to different parts of these sculptures and um, reference where they've been pilfered from our house in Queens or, or taken off a fence post in Brooklyn when we're walking around and, um, and then arranging these in compositions together. And one of the things that I really see when I look at the work um, that Lisa and, I, Lisa and I make kind of overlapping our, our individual interests is how can we make sculptures into drawings? How can we make paintings and works on paper into sculptures? Um, and then the, the different things that were happening in our lives as well when we were making this work. Um, our father had just passed away and we were helping our mom clean out our, our familial house in Queens. Um, and we, we had discovered that not many things had been thrown out um, during our family's uh, kind of tenure within that house. And so um, we were looking at different ways in which things could be completely reimagined. Um, and how can something that's super familiar um, become super unfamiliar? And how can something that become that's so um, kind of banal become kind of magical? Um, so this is a sculpture um, at the Arizona State um, uh, ASU Art Museum, and it's Shout a tent. Out to Garth. What's that? Shout out to Garth. Shout out to Garth, um, who invited us to come, and we got to spend some amazing time uh, with Garth and Claire and Willa and Ramona while we were um, in residence in, in Phoenix and Tempe, um, summer of 2017. And um, we used this really uh, kind of banal part of a, um, uh, some trash. It was a part of a tent um, uh, kind of um, a structure um, to create something that we, we wanted to create and hold space for something that felt um, kind of magnetic and powerful. And so the, the, the sculpture in the foreground is called Force Field. Um, and the, the works in the back um, are all silk screens and they're all variables from the same different um, screens that Lisa and I made on a collaborative residency. Um, shout out to VCU Qatar. Um, and they also uh, contain, some of these um, silk screens also contain uh, pieces of plexiglass in front of them that create either windows or frames or kind of another layer on top of or in back of. Um, oftentimes within two dimensional works, there are kind of windows or parts that are cut out and fold out and, and, and kind of um, show different um, uh, viewpoints of what's behind them. Um, so windows are something that really frequently um, appear in our work in terms of um, having a multiplicity of different viewpoints and vantage points and also kind of hiding different secrets behind windows and doors. These different uh, vantage points, as well as kind of being transparent about the handmade quality and the sort of mistakes in the mark of our hands, either literally a cast of our hands or being really transparent about how something is made is also, these are also sort of hallmarks to the work that we make together as well. And in this show that was called Resistors, there was this amazing hallway with these window niches uh, that led to it. And it allowed us to invite the public to, to do a workshop with us where people made sculptures and then 
uh, put them into these niches and it's becoming part of the exhibition. Uh, this is a project um, that I'm going to put uh, another note in the chat of uh, a wonderful series that out of brick um, that they put on called Brooklyn is Masquerading as the World. And they interviewed us specifically about this project. So if you're interested, um, you can check out a full video about it. But it's called Collaborators, Companions, um, Collaborators, Comrades, and Good Companions, where we worked with the Good Companions Senior Citizen um, Center in the Lower East Side. And it was a kind of um, uh, initial fellowship through Abrams Art Center where they wanted to create a bridge to the Senior Citizen Center, which is also under this kind of umbrella of the Henry Street Settlement, which does all kinds of things from arts programming to, um, you know, after school care, to working with senior citizens, to job placement, to all different kinds of services in the Lower East Side. Where we were able to collaborate with photographers and the community at the senior center to um, create these portraits um, where the, the people who were uh, the folks who were collaborating with us and um, interacting with the projects were able to then have these uh, photographs printed and they were able to take them in physical form, which was a really lovely part of the project um, when we were and the staff at the senior center as well. And it all started because we asked um, the senior, the, the folks at the senior center, you know, what would you like us to do with you? And they were like, we love to party. So we made those pinatas. We had a kind of celebratory event and, and we partied with them. Um, and we have here, here, where um, we, we were saying hello to Jorge Rojas before, who invited us over to the Acme Lab and at the um, UMFA in Salt Lake City, where we had an amazing time creating here, here together. Um, this is the sort of um, manifesto that was available as soon as you walked into the room. And it was this non-prescriptive space where Janelle and I created objects that were sometimes super sturdy and also other times like super not sturdy <laughs> that were made out of paper mache, but all these different handmade objects that then could be arranged and rearranged depending on who was using the space. And this is a really this is really satisfying in terms of seeing um, how the space could be used across many different kinds of populations that the museum served. So the UMFA is actually on um, a university campus, and so it very much serves this local community of college students and professors. But it's also a huge museum within the state of Utah in terms of um, serving K through 12 arts education as well. And then it's also you know anybody that would come to the museum, um, it's you know it's serving the general public. And so one thing that we were thinking about was how do we um, really kind of use this particular um, situation and context to invite people to see the museum as theirs and think about what a museum space could be and what an exhibition could be. Um, and so in the in the space, all of the, the furniture that you see is on wheels and fits into each other. And so things could be really put away and the space could be used um, for movement or for organizing or for birthday parties. I think Jorge's son had a birthday party party there, which we were super excited about. Um, you could shoot a music video, you could um, use this, you know, you could check out the space on your own if you wanted to as well to have a kind of, um, you know, a, a space to write. You could bring a, a whole class there if you're a professor um, and talk about Dada or, or, um, or one of our friends had a philosophy class there. So we had a, a book that you could write down suggestions also as a kind of score um, for other people to enact. And so um, if you didn't want to come up with something yourself, you could also peruse this book of scores and um, try an activity or a formal device that somebody else had developed. And that project also allowed us to continue thinking of this idea about how we might think about objects as perf have, having multiple performances as, as a painting, as a screen print, as a sculpture, as a costume, as a piece of furniture. So everything had these multiple ways of interaction, whether it was because of the joinery, whether or not it had hinges or wheels. And some of the objects were kind of taken in and out during the exhibition and replaced. And so if you came at different times, you might see different, um, different things that were there as well. Here we have a, a picture of a wonderful photograph of our, our mama, Bodhild Iglesias, our, collab our oftentimes collaborator, uh, working at the Textile Arts Center, a wonderful residency in Brooklyn. 
um, where you can see where uh, Boathild is working on a knit painting um, and you can see the knit paintings hung around her. And in this project, we're very much interested in translations. So this project has to do with some of the earlier works that Janelle and I did in which we translate each other's work where Janelle might, find, might uh, recontextualize a part of a sculpture or a part of an object and um, bring it to the studio. And then we create like a, a mimicry or a counterfeit in, in um, painted form. And this translation often took place either over, you know, through the mail or in our studio practices where we have these works on paper that we trade back and forth and do layer upon layer upon layer on. And sometimes having to, you know, sometimes these paintings are developed over years and years. And these paintings are often, we curate from the paintings and we have meetings with Bodhild and talk about how to transform them to knit paintings. And our mom has been knitting, I think since she was about nine. Is that right, Lisa? Mm -hmm. um, you know, she grew up, uh, you know, skiing to school in a very different kind of world um, than we did. And, but has never, and she's always knit, um, but she's never really considered herself an artist with a capital A. And, and I think that this project in particular, um, in terms of collaborating with our mom has been a really amazing tool in which we've um, been able to have all these conversations about creativity, about making, about the hand, about the possibilities of how one thing can become another, um, about women's work, about um, value. And um, we've been able to, to, to just sort of um, open ourselves to see what happens uh, when we ask different kinds of questions. This is a project we did at um, Ortega y Gasset, OYG Gallery in Brooklyn, um, that also included an audio tour by Lisa Sun Bowie. That we'll hear a little snippet from a little bit later. And um, this was at Brick in Brooklyn. Um, you can see here one of, the, one of the hinged paintings that we showed before, as well as a new installation that incorporated weavings um, that Bodhill did at the Textile Arts Center, as well as objects that we collected. Um, and at the Textile Arts Center, we installed this work that had um, an armature, a wooden armature for experimenting with hanging these knit paintings and weavings in different sorts of um, configurations. And in this work, we were very influenced, we were very much influenced by the work of Annie Albers, as well as a sort of matriarch of textiles, as well as our, um, our, uh, best, our best of moods work, um, our mother's mother. And you can see the woven rag rug in the background and then responses that are hanging vertically. And I put in the chat an upcoming exhibition at the Nordic Museum in Seattle, um, upon which we're kind of expanding this installation. And we're also gonna be showing a number of different knit paintings that we've been working on for about the past five years. Uh, we recently did a residency with our mom in Guatemala at a rug um, that's attached to um, a rug factory where we were able to do some weaving together in person and, um, and, and kind of experiment with different ways of making knit paintings collaboratively. Um, and so this work continues to, to morph and shift um, and, and we're continuing to find ways to collaborate, whether it be sending things in the mail or some of us, you know, um, dyeing the yarns and sending the yarn to somebody else or cutting up a textile and sending it to somebody and having a kind of dialogic um, response back and forth um, with what happens to these textiles. We also frequently send each other readings or writings or, um, you know, notes from our studios as well to kind of keep in conversation with each other. Um, and so we're really excited to see what happens with this work when we kind of put it all together in one in one space, which will be happening this fall. And Bowie's actually going to be doing an audio tour for that exhibition as well. Uh, and so connected to the, I, I love what you said before, Janelle, about like this opportunity to teach each other things, because I think that that the textile works that we're making with our mother is such a, a context and opportunity, like as you mentioned, to talk about different ways that we can work together. And so our mother is like teaching and reteaching us knitting techniques and crochet and figuring out how to do these things together through the mail during COVID. Um, we're figuring all of that stuff out. And as Janelle mentioned, um, the show that we have upcoming in the fall at the Nordic Museum, we're going to be having another audio tour for, um, and that's a way that we have um, other family members collaborate. In this case, um, my kid named Bowie, and um, they are working out right now some of the new audio tours and will be helping us make a new takeaway poster. And um, we this is a little snippet of one of 
uh, the sort of um, sections that you'd get to hear when you visit uh, an installation. Hello. Now it's time to look for the painting that looks like a zebra. What does it close your eyes for 10 minutes? What does it smell like? What does it look like? I, I love your imagination. It's so good. Take a friend if you want to. Okay, now it's time to go, lovers. We're time to go. And that, our friends, is the way that we're concluding our talk. It was a we we wanted to bring you sort of like on a on a quick kind of tour through the different kind of projects that Janelle and I do, since our work um, takes on many different types of projects. And we're so glad we're so glad that you joined all of us. I'm going to stop my share and we can have a conversation. Nice. That was wonderful. Oh, uh, Chris Nakata. I'm going to keep you spotlit on my uh, computer. Um, so now is the best part, besides the best part, it's the second best part, which is to ask Lisa and Janelle anything. There was a question actually in the chat. Can I start with that? Yeah. yeah. I think I missed it. It was from Mar. Um, uh, do you have a specific name or terminology for the way you stare at the camera? I assume this person doesn't mean in Zoom. I believe it has to do with the photographs while you're pregnant or acting pregnant or, you know, yeah. Yeah, I think that there's, you know, because we have these different, Janelle and I, we, we don't consider ourselves um, photographers by any means, but we use we use photographs quite a bit in our process. And oftentimes we want it to, to just be this kind of boring rote objective, like document of what's happening. Um, so oftentimes we'll hand, maybe. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so oftentimes we try ourselves looking just straight on into the camera because it's not so much, it's just trying to capture some of that moment. And whether it's like a competition where we have cherries in our mouth or whether it's the commiserate series, that I think that was a really, that's an interesting observation about like the gaze and where we're looking. Um, and I think it has to do about like stripping it down to, like you said, this deadpan kind of boring <laughs> level. But it's interesting, I think even in those photos and with trying to look a specific, just kind of straightforward way into the camera, um, our, our posture and our, and the slight variations of our gaze still kind of betray in a, in a good way, they give away what's happening in the kind of context of that particular photo as well. And so, um, while we're not necessarily, yeah, while we're, while we, while our expressions are similar, um, there's definitely like more buoyancy and fun in the first series than there is in terms of a kind of sadness and heaviness and a kind of separation in the last series as well. So that's kind of an interesting thing. I think that we don't necessarily try to accomplish, but um, we'll come through uh, just because we're, we're, we're just, uh, we are how we are in that moment. Uh, I'll read another question here. Um, what is the best way to start a collaboration with your family members? <laughs> <laughs> um, I think uh, in, in any way, in any kind of way, because I think that um, it's, I think it's really difficult. Like the, I think the reason that Janelle and I are drawn to collaborating with each other is not because it's super easy and always fun because <laughs> Because while we try to maintain a good sense of humor and enjoy each other, I mean, I love, I love you, Janelle. And also we, we bicker so much and we have so, we have very, we're very different and we're very, each very opinionated about how we think things should go, which I think philosophically makes it interesting for us. Like, this is why we think that. Yeah, I think that's one of the reasons that our projects, we almost um, decide to try it a different way each time in terms of um, whenever we start a project, we almost make a manifesto for what we need out of that time period. And that has to do with like personally, what's going on in our lives, how much time each of us have, access to resources, et cetera, et cetera, and what makes sense logistically. But it also makes sense like 
philosophically, if, if, if one of us wants to have a, a kind of um, leader, more leadership role or a kind of philosophy about how we're going to do that project that time, um, then we, we always, instead of it being, you know, the same, every time we do a project, we get to experiment and try new things and, and take, you know, take different leads as well, um, which I think is actually really helpful for keeping that space fresh and new and fun. Um, but like, well, just like Lisa said, I would say, you know, we, we, you can't be, mean in the same way as you can be mean to your siblings and you can't call your siblings like you can't call somebody that you're call somebody on their you know on their laziness or on their um whatever it may be you know call somebody um the way that you can because you know them that well with with your sibling like the most kind and the, and, and then just the most painful. but i would That's like them. in terms of collaborating is like also valuing any kind of making together, whether it's like making ideas or cooking or recording something that, um, that I think yeah, that the question, maybe not, not necessarily needing to call it art with a capital A is the way to start is just doing things um, that feel fun and interesting and that um, kind of harness your, your curiosity and your energy and what you want to be doing with your family members. And um, if they're into it as an art project, then it's a good excuse to do those things. But also I think that art can be really intimidating and alienating to call something art to certain people and, and especially certain ages. Um, and so sometimes if it's more just like, let's do an experiment together or let's go on an adventure or let's learn something together. Um, and then once that once that's happening, then a conversation can kind of arise about kind of, you know, if it is gonna be a project, um, are they interested in it being a project that is shared or not, um, I think. Elisa, is Bowie interested in, in collaborating right now with us or less so than he was? Well, when we first started the audio tours, he was about six, I believe. Yeah, he was six when we started and he, he really enjoy, he enjoys it very much. I think at this point now we're also op opening up conversations about reciprocity. Mm -hmm. And you know, it was very much, a, we had those conversations when he was six as well, but now that he is turning nine, he's, a, you know, he's more, I think he's, we're going to be- negotiator. What, what did you say? A little bit of a negotiator. Like if I do this, that you guys want to do this, what can we do that I want to do? So and that's, that's part of it too, is the interesting conversation about how, how do I ethically involve my, my progeny, my, our family members, how, and to make sure that everyone is, um, has agency and wants to be there. So I'm hoping he wants to do it this summer. I have to talk to him. <laughs> Um, I'll read another question, but if anyone wants to just go ahead and yell out a question, feel free. Um, here's one. When was the last time you were together? And when is the next time you'll be together? We have our sad faces. No. <laughs> the last time we were together was that residency in Guatemala. Which yes. Was, um, not this past December. December, December, December before that. December 2019. 2019. Um, and I think we said goodbye in Guatemala. So it's been, been a long time since then. And then the next time we will be together, well, hopefully, fingers crossed, um, will be this summer. And um, me and my partner and uh, baby are hoping to travel and visit with Lisa and her family and meet the new baby. And um, we're also kind of dreaming up maybe spending a couple of weeks together and doing a kind of family residency, uh, self-initiated residency where we, we um, stake out some time in Lisa's studio to make, make something together. So hopefully, fingers crossed. This yeah. summer. I see that uh, Claire Joyce raised their hand. Would, do you have a question? It's um, a question from Ramona here. Hi, Ramona. Do you know any ways I can stop fighting as much with my sister? Because sometimes, well, there are some big problems between us. She does, okay. Since she's younger, she sometimes just doesn't want to play the same thing as I do. And she doesn't like it when I build with Lego stuff instead of playing with her. Can they talk about Very understandable and yes. very relatable. Is it, well, as the older sister, Lisa, do you want to feel this one? Well I, well, I can relate. I can relate, Ramona. 
Um, and also it's so nice to see you because we, I mean, I have such beautiful memories of you and your sister visiting the resistor show and like interacting with all of the artwork. So it's so nice to see you too. Um, you know, I think in some ways it's, in some ways, maybe it's good to remember like that your, your, your family members, like your siblings, there's going to be so many phases of your relationship. Janelle and I fought so much as children. And actually, I, I think now in retrospect, I think that that was really healthy because we were practicing at how to interact with each other and then how to interact, therefore, like with other people. So I think if I could go back and tell myself, like a, if I was going to tell little Lisa, one, I would probably be like, be nicer to Janelle. <laughs> <laughs> because I was probably pretty bossy because I had one year over her. Um, but also just to remember that like you two are going to be teammates for your whole life and how you interact now doesn't mean that's always how you're going to interact. And some of it is like good practice in some ways, but to just remember all that you two love each other. And that's like the, 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 the root of it. You always go back to the love, right? We were when you're really, really mad. And then also, I think the thing that we try to do still that we did when we were little, when we bought what we're trying to do now is to take turns mm -hmm. and to remember that even if we're annoyed or bored or uncomfortable or kind of over something, um, it's not going to last for forever because it'll be your turn to lead or to suggest something or to do something different in a little while. And to try to be fair and treat the other person the way that you want to be treated um, and to laugh at each other. When Lisa and I, um, one of our secret powers, I would say, to, to getting along with each other is that when we're fighting a lot, we start speaking in strange uh, made up personalities that so that I can like make fun of her made up personality and she can make fun of my made up personality. So we're not making fun of each other anymore. And we almost make it like a game. And our, then our fighting becomes hilarious and we start laughing at each other. Um, because our fighting all of a sudden is fun. And so this is something we do right now as adults. As adults. <laughs> we often text each other in these voices. So we know that what that we I don't think we're gonna share them right no, now. We're not but, going to. Um, <laughs> embarrassing. But you know, you know, like what's one of the fun things about your siblings is that you can have private jokes and secrets that nobody else knows about, right? Um, and so that's a, that's another really fun thing to help you as like a superpower. You can even make your disagreements kind of fun. Yeah. And also that you two, you two are, you know, your parents the best, like no one knows how wacky your parents are beyond the two of you. So you also have that as this like super strong force to bring you together. I we love do. that. Yeah. Um, well, there is one good thing. At least we have separate rooms. Otherwise, we wouldn't have anywhere else to go. That's super helpful. Janelle and I shared a room and the, yep, we had a bunk bed and I would, if I was on the bottom, I'd kick the ceiling. And when Janelle was on the bottom she, and I was sleeping on the top, she'd kick it too. So it's good. You have some space. You're lucky. And sometimes you need your space. So we take breaks from each other. Mm -hmm. We used to actually have to share a room whenever my room was getting redesigned for my birthday. Okay. I'm sleeping in the sister's bunk bed. Oh, I like that. You know, I we should have like a podcast with Ramona and Willa. I know we should. Note to self, Claire, we got to start a. <laughs> I love it. Um, I don't know if you know Melissa DeDorian. Uh, she's um, actually my girlfriend, and she just said her two daughters are listening and learning. <laughs> I love it. She's our girlfriend too. We love yeah, her. That's Hi. funny. Uh, um, sorry, just announced that to the world. Okay, um, let's see. We have, uh, this is from, from your friend Jorge. Uh, we, would you talk about your role as artists and in institutional critiques working in with museums and galleries and how you challenge them to be more inclusive to the communities they serve? Oh my goodness, we love Jorge. <laughs> with, working with Jorge at, at UMFA was this amazing experience because yeah, there was the institution and then there was also, we had this, this like beautiful human of Jorge Rojas and, and, the, uh, and the other community staff members there as well to interact with. Um, and bringing up ideas of like 
how much it costs to buy a ticket to have entrance to the museum. So we were able to talk with Jorge and, and, and then also by proxy talk with, you know, the museum administration about if you reserve the room to use here, here as a space to enact your own meeting, you would then get free access to the rest of the museum. So that folks who are not necessarily able to see the exhibits or see the whole museum on an average day were then able to, if they reserved the room and hung out for a little while, then they could go and use it um, and, and go see the whole museum as to how they wanted to. So I think one of the, that's something that we're super interested in, right? And also, uh, we've been super fortunate to be able to work with other artists and other administrators who are open to be to like tease apart and answer these questions. Like, does there have to be a paywall? Can we have a sliding scale? Can we have free things? Um, how can we challenge the sort of economy that's that's designed into the institutional policies? So I think that's one thing. Um, and then also just and also being really deliberate about who who is your audience and what does the audience want and then prioritizing those things as well. I think Janelle and I have a long way to go and a lot to learn in, in best practices and how to, how to best do that. Um, but it's something that we're like, that, we, that, we're, that we're constantly trying to ask ourselves, like how, how, what are different ways that we can do that, right Janelle? Yeah, I think we're, I think it helps um, having each other to kind of bounce things off of in terms of thinking about, you know, thinking about access and what does that mean in terms of, um, you know, in terms of disability or language or, um, you know, thinking about you know, like, like a paywall, thinking about um, transportation to a space. If you're trying to have certain communities have access to a space, is there actually like a public transportation line or, or could there be, um, you know, could there be a free shuttle or could there be, and sort of asking, um, asking lots of questions that you might not necessarily get the institution to say, uh, yes, we can provide all these things, but you can start a conversation in terms of brainstorming and bringing certain um, certain issues that you see to their attention. Um, and, 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 you know, increasingly trying to become more aware of these issues ourselves in our own work and our own teaching um, and how we are in the world and to bring them into the work and bring them into the institution as well. Yeah, that's a big one. Um, I have I'm a just question gonna... that. Go ahead. Oh, sorry. I have a question that sort of piggybacks on that. So I thought now would be a good time to ask. Um, hi, I love your work. Um, I just kind of found out about it, and I'm just smitten. Um, so thank you for doing this talk. Um, mm -hmm. I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about like the role of design and um, because your work's so beautiful. So that and. Um, and the role of like user experience, not like in the tech sense, but in like art as an experience um, and how you kind of go about like designing that um, before the, the community engagement happens. In terms of like the user friendly kind of um, the utilitarian quality. Yeah, sure. Like if they're using objects or if it's um, mm -hmm. using the space, like what's the process that you go through, like thinking through that together? A lot, it's just a, so much. I think that's one of the benefits of us having this um, work together, this this working group that we can, it's all this, con there's so much conversation and questioning and challenging happens where we'll bring these ideas and then because we're natural skeptics of each other and like button pushers, we want to be like, that's not going to work. Tell me how, you know, <laughs> we're automatically going to be skeptical. So I think that that's one part is like challenging and, and asking questions along the way in many, in many times, and then using the work ourselves and, and asking friends and family members to use or interact um, and also failing, like putting when so many times when these objects are in a, are touchable or um, stackable or movable, they break and fall apart. And then, you know, that informs how we might do it in another context. You know, what do you think about that? Yeah, I think that's a really good point. I think in these lectures, you know, we, we often talk about things that, that were successful of the projects. We should also, I feel like there should be a series of lectures where we talk about projects that fail and talk mm -hmm. about um, specific kinds of failures or, or not even failures with the capital F because I think that what like Lisa's saying that that trial and error is really what um, what helps you perfect something. Um, I think oftentimes we're doing things that, that really pertain to what's happening in our lives. Like I remember those paintings that opened 
open and close. That was when Bowie like loved playing hide and go seek. It was like his favorite thing whenever it was like a spare moment. It was like, can we play hide and go seek? And it was all about like, you know, and it was, he wanted to hide in things, but he also wanted to hide objects around the house that somebody else had to go find. And so it was all about kind of like finding secret spots um, where things could be hidden and where there was a sense of opening something and discovering it as well. And so um, I think some of the, the user kind of interface has to do with things that were kind of organically happening um, sometimes in our lives that, um, so that, that, felt really good and really right and didn't necessarily have to be ironed out completely. Um, and then a lot of other things were definitely trial and error. So, you know, we've talked about um, doing a kind of another project in which um, objects are used in multiple, multiple ways. But um, part of that is because we learned so much in the first iteration. Um, and in that iteration as well, we did do a bunch of stagings with other people to see what would happen and what they would do with those objects. Um, and then also the, that book of scores also helped kind of prompt and give people ideas of what, how those things could be used. Um, we also did a series of of, a, of kind of photographs and videos of us moving things around as well. And so that there was um, a little bit of like, when, when I think when you first went into the room, right in front of it, there was a, um, a screen that had some of those images. And so you could kind of, it gave you permission to play with those objects because you'd saw, saw other people and you saw us doing things with them. Um, and so one of the things we're always curious about is how much, how much information do you need to give people for them to feel like it's okay to touch things and move things around. Um, I don't think Lisa and I often think of our work as very fragile and we're not very connected to it as, as being a kind of commodity or saleable object. And so we're very okay with um, now that we now that we're both also in and in, in, within families with kids, it's important to be in a space where children are encouraged to come into the gallery space as well, instead of um, that becoming a kind of scary proposition. And so I think even with the work that we're making, if it isn't necessarily interactive with a capital I, we want to make sure that people feel comfortable around it in a way um, where they feel like they can get close to it. And um, yeah, that it isn't, there isn't kind of a, a wall there, which is, I think, one of the reasons we use so many found and kind of everyday objects and materials is because we want to kind of break down that, that wall that's there um, of something being a kind of fine art with a capital F um, object or, or um, artwork in front of them, you know, or it's, it's, it's a little bit more recognizable and a little bit more friendly in some kind of way. I hope that answers your question, but thank you for the warm words too, Kelly. Yes, and more. Thank you. <laughs> thank you, Kelly. Um, I want to go just up into the chat. There was a question asked a bit ago. I just want to make sure I grab it. Um, have either of you ever not been able to make your work for any reason? If so, what was the longest break you had to take? And how do you get back into making again if you are extremely stuck? That's a great question. <laughs> I, I think some, well, I think um, Lisa and I both have had uh, our approach after we graduated with our MFAs to making more work was um, for both of us, I think it was to work a kind of gig economy and then go on residencies. And so there were these periods of time where all we did was paint houses or nanny or try to do some studio work on the side. But oftentimes we were working to just make as much money as possible and pay off some bills and save some money. And then we would do a residency where we had a concentrated amount of time to work. So we kind of traded off those time frames, and sometimes they bled into one another where we'd, you know, be, you know, you know, working and um, working in our studios as well. But oftentimes it was a kind of an all or nothing, honestly. Um, and then I think also uh, thinking through uh, what it means. Lisa, do you want to talk a little bit about um, your transition to being a mom and making work a little bit mm -hmm. too, and, and also the teaching and making work at the same time. Those were also times that were, but I think really hard to keep making. Yeah. I think when, when I first heard this question, my mind went to uh, this time period right now, uh, COVID and, um, and then also periods of like deep grieving and also then um, being pregnant the first time when I was like super, super terrified of, 
<laughs> I'm not. being a mother and also making artwork ever again. So like there have definitely been, definitely been multiple times in my life where it's been long stretches of not making things. And I think one part of that is just being really okay with that. And that um, super productivity and making objects constantly sometimes is just not human or possible. Um, for ex- uh, or just w- makes sense for where you're at, right? Yeah, like um, when when my when my daughter uh, Luna died, I didn't make anything for for a long time because that grieving just didn't allow for that space. And I didn't. I'm not necess- I don't necessarily access the studio in times of that kind of deep kind of crisis. And I would say also for, for COVID, I'm so amazed that artists are still continuing to be so prolific during COVID because I have found the past year and more extremely difficult to make work. And then to like refer to that part of the question was like, well, how do you then restart or continue? And I think it has to do about like giving myself jobs to do that are Mm -hmm. like, I have to do, I have to accomplish this, which is a really beautiful byproduct of our collaboration is being beholden and being part of something that's not all about me. So that if Janelle and I and our mom, Bo are working on these knit paintings and right now what I can, what, what I can understand during this process of coming to a new state and and teaching at a new institution and dealing with the atmospheric and very real realities of trauma and stress of COVID and and disconnection and all of that stuff is to do things where I don't have to reinvent anything or be, or be brilliant at all. It's just like, it is to, is to crochet borders and to, and to make these pieces that will get added to something. So it's kind of, it's there's a distancing with it in a way but it's also because it's collaborative it it's I'm emboldened with a little bit more courage that it has to that it's interactive and and in relationship with another person which makes me feel connected with the studio that way so that's a I'm kind of laughing because that there's some people that are in the room that have taken classes with me before and I feel like I'm so wordy when I when it comes to answering <laughs> questions <laughs> But that's my long answer to that question. <laughs> I think I think what you're talking about too with the our collaboration having a sense of uh, more of a sense of freedom and less of a sense of judging the work um, because it's more dialogic and kind of responding to each other. I think it is easier for us to when we know that either of us is in a rut or having trouble. It's um, we often send each other works in the mail that the other person ha- and we give them the, an assignment. And the assignment might just be like, you have to react to this or you have to add something, or it might be something specific. Like Lisa, can you make a drawing of this object? Or I made this, can you add a layer of the thing that you were doing in your studio that I liked a while ago? Can you go back to that and do something on this? Um, So maybe even working with a friend, I think in that way can be really helpful where you give each other assignments and you hold each other accountable in some kind of way. Um, And that also that I think it, I think, um, yeah, having for me, I think my problem is that things are never finished unless I have a deadline. Um, so I think having having a deadline of even like a studio visit sometimes is really helpful um, because then it has to be at a certain place where you can talk about it with somebody and it gives you a little bit of fire um, under yourself to have something at a, not necessarily done with a capital D, but in a, in a place where you can show it to somebody else. Um, and then I think right now I've, you know, I'm, um, uh, my baby is three and a half months. And so I'm, um, just started taking some baby steps of going to the studio and I actually haven't done anything in the studio. I've just gotten there and set up a pack and play and I've gotten there and like moved things around. And then I've been like, I'm so exhausted. We have to go home now. Um, but I'm just trying to like touch it. Mm-hmm. Just kind of go day by day, maybe once a week and touch it. Um, and that I think is really important, whether it be your, in your, you know, in your sketchbook or in your studio, even if you go and just sit and stare at something or write something on a note card, but you just kind of like keep tabs on where you were and write down ideas about where you want to go. Um, and, um, and having that kind of written record and that physical record of looking at things and, and, um, I, you know, and, and the thing that I have to make myself do is I get stuck in one place. So I, I tell myself I'm not allowed to, um, 
to sit down for half an hour and I can't stop moving for half an hour. And within that half an hour, that embodied way of like, oh, that object should be over there or doing an errand or something. I'll have a thought of, oh, I should, oh, I want to do this. And within that half an hour, usually I'll get jump started to just get into something. Um, so that happened in the studio the other day where we brought Gus and all of a sudden I had an hour, I had an actual hour to do things and I had no idea what to do. I was so overwhelmed that I had this hour in the studio. Um, but I had, you know, I just kept moving and cleaning and sweeping. And all of a sudden I was like, oh, I have to finish threading this loom because we were going to do something. And now I remember, oh, I found these note cards. I'm going to put them up on the wall. And then I remembered an idea. And so I think um, keep on moving is my advice to jumpstart yourself again. Those are both amazing answers for everything, for the world. So yeah, <laughs> that was really, really great. Uh, I hate to cut this off, but it's a little after 8 p.m. here, unless there's any burning questions that you have to have answered right now. I think there was a question. Was of, one, did I miss one? There was a question from a, someone that I, someone I know from a long time, from Christine okay. um, oh, about um, when we decided to become artists. And I think. Sorry about that. I missed that one. I saw that you wrote back. So I just was like. Yeah, no, that's okay. I just wanted to answer it really quickly because um, I think so many times I go to artist talks and I hear that like people talking about wanting to be artists mm -hmm. forever that they've all. And I, that's, that's not, I can't, <laughs> I, I, that that's not it's interesting that it's like never something that I can really relate to it's um because Janelle and I have often referred to ourselves as late bloomers and we didn't realize that we wanted to become art practicing artists until our I would say our 20s yeah, yeah. like college and after college um and that it was something that came, it was oftentimes when Janelle and I talk about this together and in public, it's this idea that art for us encompasses all these different things that we love, that it could be this place for literature and science and um, absurdity and ridiculousness and um, activism could all live in one place together in a beautiful way that we didn't have to choose. We could kind of collapse all of those seemingly siloed areas. And so we didn't really, I don't think that we really figured that out until college and afterwards. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so I just wanted to put that out there for anyone else who feels in the group that you are also a leap bloomer. <laughs> um, yeah, that's great. I'm definitely um, a late bloomer. And Mildred <laughs> just said that her kids are Dominican and Norwegian as well. Look at that. Oh, oh my goodness. <laughs> that's um, send us an email, send please. Send us an email. Whoa. Yeah. We effectively sometimes call ourselves Norwinicans. We haven't met any. We haven't met any Norwinicans before. Norwinicans and Hispanavians. Yes. That's please amazing. Yeah. This has Thank been you. so yeah, Norwinican. <laughs> <laughs> so lovely to to share this time with you, Kristen, and Vermont Studio oh, Center yes. and, and Kathy Black. I, hello and hi Kathy. I like to always say hi to her when she's hi, small Kathy. on my screen. Yeah, I was like, whoa, Kathy Black is here because, like, you're Vermont Studio Center. I'm her um, boss now, by the way. I tell her what to do. Right, Kathy? <laughs> Say yes. See? <laughs> and it's, it's really also, that's something else that I just wanted to mention really quickly. Janelle and I still consider that being residents at the Vermont Studio Center, and that's a very recent memory for us. Mm -hmm. And so to be having, you know, being here with you is really, is really special. And also seeing your names and seeing your faces and having your, seeing the chat, this is super, super lovely um, in a time period that's really difficult. So thank you for this, everyone. Yeah, it's a great night. Thank you. That was an amazing talk. Your answers were really touching and honest. And what a nice looking audience we have, especially Dimples. He's still on my screen. <laughs> I just He just lights up my whole screen with his dimples. He's also an amazing artist. Brett. I can't believe it. His dimples and he's an amazing artist. An amazing artist and such a nice person too. I, I mean, can tell he's nice. Yeah, yeah he is. <laughs> sorry. I'm really sorry. <laughs> all these people are nice though. Yeah, they're all nice. And they all look great. And some of them probably have dimples too. Um, <laughs> Thanks so much. That was really a great talk. Thank you. So yeah. good to be here. That was really great. Thank you so much, both of you. If you yeah. want to stay on and talk to these people, I, I don't want to kick you off. <laughs> <laughs>
Mm -hmm. um, I can just do other things and walk away and just keep the window open. <laughs> I definitely have to go uh, pee soon because okay. that right. happens every five minutes. So I, that's like my, my brain is popping off like must use facilities, but that's, and I just want to be transparent about that because the pregnancy is real, man. And we don't need to hide it. Yeah. <laughs> oh, I appreciate that. You can also edit that out of the recorded. No, that's actually the only <laughs> thing I'm keeping. Special, that's like special <laughs> stuff for all of the people who are visiting. <laughs> We cut it out our bad jokes, Kristen. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, thank you so much. Thank you. And thank you much very soon. And I'll make sure you see this before anybody else does. See what you like. Okay. Sounds awesome. And if anybody wants to get in touch, our email is just uh, lasermanasiglesias at gmail.com. And um, if anybody that's a late, a late, stare wants uh posters you can always email us you don't want to get them very long sometimes they're in storage in new york but um we often send out posters if anybody wants any cool. of our takeaways nice <laughs> all right thank, thank you, you so much. much thanks everybody thanks.